Good morning, people. Good morning. <laughs> How we miss John Schultz. Thank you, Diane, for that uh, wonderful music beforehand, though I hardly could hear it because of all the talking going on out here. It's really nice to see that. Um, Welcome to you all on this May long weekend, and I'm surprised that there's this many people here on a long weekend. <clears throat> Whether you are joining us here in this place of worship for the first time, live from your living room, or maybe your RV. Do we have any Zoomers today? Doesn't look like it. Or maybe some campground via Zoom, or you'll join us later on YouTube. You are so welcome in this place. As we all enjoy the remainder of this first long weekend of our Canadian summer, I know it's not quite summer, but if there's no snow on the ground, it must be summer. <laughs> this is the time of year that we marvel at God's creation as we watch the first crops break, and I saw some uh, hay cut this morning. There's, there's hay already down. It's hard to believe it used to be June. Now we're cutting it in May. Um, and we witness uh, the return of many species of birds and watch them build their nests and lay eggs and nurture the, the next generation of their species. It is such a privilege. Speaking of privileges, we as a congregation would like to acknowledge the privilege of worshiping on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutral peoples. We give thanks to all who have nurtured and cared for this land before us. As we welcome each other this morning and we witness the wonder in God's creation, may we pray for those who may be suffering in the path of natural destruction as many forest fires rage across our country. We also pray for those around the world who suffer at the hands of man. May the peace of God enter the hearts of those who would bring harm to their fellow human beings. May through your love mercy be shown. We, uh, we would like to take note of announcements this morning. Um, anyone wishing to come forward with an announcement, please do so at this time. Um, I'd like to highlight a few. Um, Herb and Shirley have asked me to highlight the seniors event that is happening this Thursday at 2 p.m. Is it, is it this Thursday? May 25th. <laughs> Shirley was just so taken aback by her picture on there. Now she's really scared. So <laughs> they would like you to invite your friends and uh, and sign up today, just so that they'd know who'd be coming. Um, so be ready for, for the laughter that may be coming your way. Uh, there will be refreshments served. We have a uh, New Hamburg relief sale, Mennonite relief sale coming up. And uh, you may have seen the email plea for help to, to make and sell tea balls for the relief sale. So anyone who would be uh, inclined, please, please do so. Um, it is in, in assistance to the Floridale uh, uh, Mennonite Church community. They have traditionally uh, done the tea ball booth at uh, the New, New Hamburg relief sale and they really do need some help. Um, we have our church camping weekend at Hidden Acres coming up on the 9th, uh, 9th to the 11th. So um, let, I think it is Juanita that is 
putting that together. And uh, if you're interested in camping with us, um, I'm going to try it with a two-year-old. Um, that should be fun. <clears throat> um, our, and, and speaking of the uh, Hidden Acres camp, our church has been asked to donate pies for the pie auction at Hidden Acres Chicken Barbecue. Uh, please contact Luke or, or Dolores Schwarzentruber. They are going to try and, and uh, get pies together for, uh, for the camp. Our North of 60s men's breakfast is going to meet all through the summer. Most things done, don't happen at the church during the summer, but we're going to continue the men's breakfast because uh, the boys all thought it was so good to, to get together. So um, put that in your calendars, you fellow old guys. <laughs> Bible school at Cross Hill Mennonite Church is always well attended, so sign up early. So if you have some little ones that want to go to Bible school, um, our church and uh, Cross Hill Mennonite Church uh, get together to uh, put that on, and uh, it is held at Cross Hill Mennonite Church. <clears throat> and I think... Claire had an announcement. I knew he wouldn't forget me. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Just want to give a quick shout out to Belongathon, and I know it's on the same Saturday as uh, Church Camping Weekend, but it's a new fundraiser for Christian Horizons, an organization that you may or may not be familiar with. It's a non -per non -per not for profit ministry serving individuals with disabilities in the provinces of Ontario, Saskatchewan, and globally as well in a multiple of countries. Again, just in, just in case you don't know much about the organization, all the programs in our province of Ontario and Saskatchewan are government funded, but the global programs, family camp programs, those are all funded through donations. And so that is the focus of our fundraising project this year. Focus being renovating a abandoned munitions factory in Bakoji, Ethiopia. They want to transform it into a community center for the community. And then the remaining 20% of funds will go to support families who have children with disabilities who cannot afford a summer camp week at Elam Bible Camp. And those weeks are pretty significant, very significant, I should say it that way, for families with kids with disabilities. Details have been in the info page. Love to see some people join me for a bike ride on the morning of June 10. If you're interested, we're going to be doing a couple kilometers from the G2G trail from Wallenstein west and back, depending how far you want to go. We'll let you get back before lunch. And or in the afternoon, if you want to go for a walk, they were doing a 5K walk from the Christian Horizons offices in Waterloo. So again, thank you. And of course, all you know, donations are also very much appreciated. Thank you to some of those of you who have already Bless me with a donation. And someone, someone would, you know, someone asked me, why would you call it a belongathon? You know, just kind of, with, with, with a hint that this is a bit of a strange name. The name comes from our vision statement as a, as an organization of Christian Horizons. The vision statement says, the the vision is that people who experience disabilities belong to communities in which their God-given gifts are respected and valued. And again, I thought of that this morning. That's something I believe that you here at Wellesley Mennonite have understood and, uh, and lived with for many years and have blessed many people that way. So if you have questions, see me during coffee. I'll even let you have an extra coffee if you donate. No, that's not true. <laughs> thank you. I'd like to thank all of our helpers today, our, our of course, our awesome AV crew back there in the booth, um, Diane Peters, our pianist, and our song leaders who will be coming up today. Um, at this time, uh, please quiet our hearts and listen to Diane and our musical interlude. Thank you, Diane. <laughs>
This time I'd like to call to worship. We come to worship. Um, some of us are exhausted. Some of us are curious about Jesus. Some of us are hungry. And some of us are disoriented. Some of us are broken. We gather around you today, O Christ. Teach us, lead us. Grant us your peace. Amen. Please bow your heads for the opening prayer. God of heaven and earth, we long to be truly free. In this hour of worship, help us to grasp the freedom that comes from seeing you more clearly. Loving, loving you more dearly and following you more nearly. Day by day, give us strength and courage to be your people in this time, in this place. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me, I forgot my Bible. We worship in scripture and in song. Psalm 95. Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout loud in the rock of our salvation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let us come before him in thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks before him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down to worship. As us, let us kneel before the Lord and Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did. Oh, sorry. That was the end. <laughs> we'll now have a song. I sing the mighty power of God. Uh, please come forward, song leaders, and please rise if you're able.
um, we are going to, together, we're going to say, saw, read Psalm 68, 32 to 35. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to the Him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, who thunders with mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the heavens. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Our next hymn is found in Voices Together, number 84. To God be the glory. morning we hear God's word in Peter, 1 Peter. I kind of like that, me and I got a little guy named Peter. <laughs> and while I was reading my student Bible, um, and I'll tell you, I'm still a student, that's for sure, um, I came across a, a little teaching part of the Bible that talks about the radical shift of Peter. So, dear friends, 
Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when the glory is revealed. That 413 radical shift, this one, uh, this one verse uh, talks about how Peter was shifted and how, how Jesus admonished him in uh, Matthew 8.33. And I'm going to read that passage. But when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, sinner, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. And I continue on with uh, 1 Peter 4, 14. If you are insulted because of this, the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you hear that name. And Peter 5, 6 to 11. <clears throat> Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, <clears throat> excuse me, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around you like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your merciless throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And for God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while with him will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him, he the power forever and ever. Amen. Our next song is God of Grace and God of Glory. Please stand, if you are able. Turn and hit your hymn, num book number 716, God of Grace and God of Glory.
Good morning and welcome to this time of worship. And I need to add a special welcome this morning. It is so good to see Robbie here this morning. As you probably know, he spent the last week in hospital. Friday afternoon, he said, Claire, I'm going to be getting out this afternoon and I'm going to be there at church on Sunday morning. And I said, well, I think there's still a decision or two to be made yet. And I know there was tests that follow that. But Robbie, it's good to have you here. Yes. I appreciate that sense of commitment of saying, I am going to be at church on Sunday morning. And it was great to see him walk in this morning. Again, just such a privilege to fellowship together as believers, to celebrate as Christ followers, to celebrate that Jesus is alive. God is present through the Holy Spirit. And as we move to Pentecost, and by the way, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday already. It's like hard to believe that we've come from Easter through to Pentecost next week. We'll continue this serious theme of created, called, and shaped Easter witnesses. And we have the privilege of living that story. We, we live that story in our rear view mirror. We know that Christ is risen. He is alive. He has rescinded to heaven. Ascension was just this past week, and uh, we, again, we some churches I know celebrate that day significantly, others do not. I want to start us though this morning, maybe in a bit of a strange way, but I hope it'll all make sense in the end. I want us to go back and look at some of the disciples' story for the past three years, and especially then the last couple of weeks. There we go. Thanks, John. He had that change for me before I could find the right switch. <laughs> Think of being a disciple, what it must have been like. For three years, they've walked, they've ministered with Jesus. They learned, they grew, faced overwhelming situations, real storms out on the Sea of Galilee, emotional, spiritual storms, they shared miraculous moments. Yet also at times, I believe they had no clue of what Jesus was talking about and didn't understand what he was doing and where he was going. And my first thought when I reflected on that statement is how much like life today sometimes we have just that sense of, God, what are you doing in me and through me? What are you doing in our communities or in our world? They had joyed in that Passover meal with Jesus. But then we're shocked by his announcement that one of you will betray me. Can you imagine sitting at that table? You've walked with Jesus for three years and he turns to them and says, one of you before this night is over, one of you will betray me. Jesus is arrested. Most of the disciples flee, went into hiding for fear of the Jews and what might happen to them. And yes, Christ died. And most of them were not there to see it, to experience that death on the cross of Christ. He was buried, yet three days later, the women, and then Peter and John come to them saying, he's alive, he's risen, the tomb is empty. And again, the shock, the surprise, the joy, the uncertainty of that. And then, of course, of course Christ appears to them in a locked room. And again, I just can't quite fathom what that experience must have been like to know that he is risen, to understand that in some way, and then all of a sudden for Christ to appear in the room, yet he didn't walk in through the door. Just the emotional, I'm not sure, explosion that they must have felt there. And then one day Jesus leads them out toward Bethany, as Luke writes, and he ascends into heaven with a promise that he'll return. Again, the emotions of that moment. The loss. He's, he's leaving. He's going. The joy, anticipation of his return. The uncertainty of knowing when will that take place. And I, as I say, I, I struggle to fathom that range of emotions that the disciples must have experienced over those three years, but in particularly that last week or two with Jesus on this earth. 
the breadth of emotions, hope, fear, despair, joy, anticipation. And then, of course, as we move into the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit's poured out in the Acts community, poured out on the disciples and the apostles, and revival breaks out. I mean, life is transformed for hundreds and thousands of people in that community. The disciples' world literally have changed. And yet within days, you read that first two, three chapters of Acts, there's transformation, there's power, there's evidence of God moving, and then they're arrested. The disciples, the apostles are arrested, thrown into jail. And again, I can't. How many times that night did they look at each other and say, what are we doing? This has happened. Now this, we're sitting in jail. And again, God miraculously intervenes an angelic angel being guides them and leads them out of prison. Doors are locked. They pass through the doors and out they go. Committed to the next day, they're back in the temple preaching. Again, overwhelming emotional processing that they're taking place in their lives. But within hours of preaching in the temple the next morning, the disciples are hauled back before the Sanhedrin. They want to kill them. The Sanhedrin are ready to kill the disciples right on the spot. But one of the leading Pharisees convinces them that they should just let them be. They should be flogged. And they were ordered to never again preach the name of Christ, but they should be let go. Never again preach the word of Christ? You know that's not going to happen. Acts 5 verse 41 states this. Am I moving in the wrong? There we go. No, we're going the wrong direction. Maybe I'll just let this man take control because I'm not clicking right. That's a bad sign to the pastor say I'm not clicking. <laughs> Acts 5.41, it says this, the apostles left the Sanhedrin. Again, remember what they've just walked through. They've been in jail for a night. They've been arrested. They've been released from prison by an angel. They go back to the temple. They're again taken to the Sanhedrin, flogged. And you know that the flogging was not a pretty thing. They rejoiced because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Why start the message from this point? Well, to me, again, I wanted us... And I, I, for me, I find it difficult to grab hold of what would it have been like to be a disciple? These are normal, functioning, average, run-of-the-mill human beings, just like you and I. I shouldn't call us run-of-the-mill, should I? We're special. But we're normal human beings, just like the disciples, who followed Jesus, who experienced joy, struggle, hope, frustration, Moments of exaltation, just of absolute joy of miraculous happenings. And at some point, we're just so exhausted, they just wanted to go home and sleep. But now, with the presence of the power and the Holy Spirit having been poured out on them, in spite of the challenges and the pain that they were facing, they said, we will not stop. And they didn't. See that last line again? They never stopped. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is Christ. No matter what it was they were facing, they said, we will stand firm. But we need to get that next slide in here. When I think, and I want you to think of standing firm in Christ, Look at that picture. I don't know what's below him. The picture didn't show me. I don't know if it's a 10,000 foot drop, if it's a little cliff on the edge of thing, 
But I, I, when I think of the word standing firm in Christ, I want us to see that picture in our minds. It's standing on the rock. That rock, again, the symbol of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul understood that need to encourage the church, to encourage new believers to not be discouraged, to never give up because of suffering. And it's not, it wasn't easy for them. They were suffering. They were persecuted. There was tough situations of life. And in 1 Corinthians 1, next slide, please. Next, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says to the believers there, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Typical fall, Paul fashion, it wasn't let, don't let most things move you. It's like nothing, let nothing, 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 nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Next slide, Ephesians 6. Paul again writes to the church in Ephesus saying, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. And he goes on to explain some of the attributes of the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. What does it look like to stand firm? I think both Paul and Peter would agree and say, standing firm says, ready, be ready. Fight the good fight. The victory is yours. God is present. And the reality is that life does not seem fair. That worked. Have you ever considered that? I know that in teaching students, Many times I heard the phrase coming back to me as a teacher or principal, well, that's not fair. And there's part of me would say, you're right, it's not. <laughs> but it's still a reality. And the challenge for us, and maybe I should say for me, but there's sometimes when life doesn't seem fair, some people get angry. Some strike out for revenge. They want to get somebody back. Some look for someone to blame, and God's usually an easy target there. Why did God allow this to happen in my life? Some believers even would say, well, it's time to put God on the shelf. If God's going to let me make me go through this kind of situation, we'll just put him on the back shelf and I'll call him out when I need to. There's a whole lot of people in our community, in our congregation here, that are struggling with health issues, life-changing cancers, broken, hurting bodies, struggles with addictions. And these can be tough roads to walk, tough roads to navigate, tough times to stand in firmness, to stand firm in the faith. Things shake us. I reflected again that this past week and that young man from Ukraine and his child who were here and Kara shared that I wasn't here that Sunday but war in our world has displaced millions and millions of people. I've never had to walk through that experience of having to leave my home, leave my country, go to another country as a refugee. I can't really understand what that would be like. And yet I, I questioned myself and said, what would, what would it be that would cause me to stand firm in my faith as I learned a new language, learned a new culture, tried to find a job, all of those things that are involved in coming into a new country. Would I be able to stand firm? Would I be ready to say, God, I'm trusting you for your provision in my life today, tomorrow, next week, next year? In this past week, there's two situations that came into my life that caused me to just sort of do a recheck and say, Claire, where are you at? Are you ready? Would you be ready to handle this situation? Would you be ready to stand firm? Somehow going forward is going reverse. There we go. Thank you. Tuesday morning, I received an email from BIC Missions in the U.S. 
requesting prayer for BIC missions, people, and pastors in the community of Farmington, New Mexico. Monday, sometime during the day, a young man in that community had randomly pulled out a gun and began shooting in the residential community. The result of that shots being fired killed three, wounded numbers of others. The young man then was also shot and killed by law enforcement when they arrived. It was random, apparently unprovoked. I don't know that it even made the news. I never saw it on any of the newscasts that I was watching. It simply became, became being a part of our world too often. But it was unprovoked violence that shook a community. It destroyed lives. It destroyed a family, multiple families. And the question that came to my mind was, if that had been my son, if one of those victims in that shooting had been a family member for myself, what would my response be? How would I handle that situation? Would I be able to stand firm in my faith and say, God, you've called me to forgive, and I choose to forgive that individual? Would my faith be able to stand firm in that challenge of such pain and tragedy? Tuesday afternoon at the Chandler Mode Community Center, if we can go to the next slide. Tuesday afternoons, in, in general, the gathering church, in, in support and cooperation with the House of Friendship and uh, the Waterloo Region Food Bank, supplies upwards of 225 to 250 bags of snacks, healthy foods, fruit, juice boxes, etc., to kids as they come home from school in the Chandler Mode community. This past week, a young man, I will call him Saul. I think that's appropriate when we talked about Paul this morning. I'll call him Saul. Young man in his 20s, early 20s. He had volunteered, he volunteers periodically, did much more a year ago, but he volunteers periodically on Tuesday afternoons. And he came with us that day, and he had previously shared some of his story with me. But as we were waiting for kids, we had packed up the bags. We were out on the, on, the, on the edge of the streets. We have four locations that we set up, and I had the privilege of having Saul with me at the one table. And there was another new volunteer there, and I heard as I came over, the two of them were sitting at the a table just behind our, our table. And he was sharing some of his story with a volunteer. Saul was born in Ethiopia. His mother was Ethiopian. His father was Italian. As a young child, they fled to Yemen from Ethiopia because of civil unrest within their community area in Ethiopia. He talked about attending a Christian church in Yemen. In spite of some years of conflict from the militia there, the local militia, and some other religious factions in their community. But one day, as they were leaving church and walking down their streets to their home, suddenly shots rang out behind them, and a family that they had just seen in church were brutally murdered on the streets behind them. And he says, as a young man, as a child, he said, I remember my parents yelling, run, run, and they did but they never went back to that church again for fear of their lives. Saul grew up knowing persecution for his faith. His family knew for persecution. They came to Canada as refugees. His parents have since separated. Saul now lives with his, parent, or his mom and two sisters. And he is just a gracious, wonderful young man. I thoroughly appreciate who he is. He has a faith but he's hurting. And one of his comments to me later that afternoon was he said, Claire, I don't have any friends my age. I have no close friends who are my age. And my question to me again, how do I, how do we as a community, how do I as an individual support young men, young women in that kind of a situation to stand firm in the faith that he knows and yet struggles with to be a part of his life? 
And so we want to take a few moments this morning to look briefly at some of the passages that Brad read for us this morning from 1 Peter. How do we stand firm in the faith? And it is going to be brief because each one of these comments, each one of these statements, I believe, from Scripture, we could probably spend a whole sermon on. I want us to remember before we go there, and Brad, you mentioned this, who is Peter? Peter, a man who was rebuked by Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan, get behind me, sinner. Your mind is not on God, things of God. Your mind is on things of the world. Peter, a man of boisterous, confident faith, a man who said, Jesus, I will follow you anywhere, and then denied even three times that he even knew Jesus. He knew what it was like to not stand firm. Peter knew what it was like to fall and to stumble and, and to fall badly. But he had been restored. He had been forgiven. He had been brought back into community with Christ and the disciples. And he had been renewed through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he had a new passion to share his faith and we see, if we go back and read the book of Acts, he became that leader that God had designed him to be and created him to be. So let's look at just four admonishments, four teachings, four comments that would say, if I am going to stand firm in my faith, these are things that need to be cared for. First Peter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Other, script, other versions say, do not be surprised at the suffering that comes your way, that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Life isn't fair. There's times it's like, I didn't ask for this situation. And Peter writes, don't be surprised with suffering. Don't be surprised at something that this is coming in your life as if it was something strange. It's part of our lives. And this, the NIV version here, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. And if you read 1 Peter 1, chapter 1, Peter writes and talks about the sufferings, the issues that we deal with in life as a means of God refining us purifying our faith and refining and I'm no metalist met, met, metal, you know, anyway that, that person who deals with metals and refined metals but I understand it's a fair bit of heat it's a burning process to get rid of the impurities how does God remind us that he is refining us and changing it sometimes it's through through suffering. Yes, I am going backwards, am I? I'll just leave it totally to John. Remember Christ's comment, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, issues. But take heart, I have overcome the world, he says. Jesus said to his disciples, and he says to us, don't be surprised at the things you're going to face. Don't be surprised at suffering. It's part of our world. It's a part of our sinful world. But take heart. Have peace. Live in peace. I have overcome the world. And I'll be honest, that to me is not an easy process. And some of you have walked that road. Many, In fact, probably many of us have walked that road where we face situations saying, God, this is not fair. I didn't need this. I don't need this. And God says, but I am with you. In fact, he also suggests, and let's go to the next slide. Peter says, in the midst of that suffering, I call you, I command you, I admonish you to rejoice. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Rejoice. 
And I, I'll be honest, when I read that verse, it's like, oh, there's something within me that just says, how can I do that, God? That's not what I'm, that's not my natural instinct at all to rejoice. But it's a common theme from Paul as well. He rejoices, as he says in one of his writings, he rejoices that he is considered worthy of sharing in Christ's suffering. I struggle with patience at times. I know that's hard to believe. I understand that. But when things, when I'm in the middle of a crisis, when I'm in the middle of something that is stressing me, when I'm in the middle of pain, there's an impatience that comes in my life that says, I want this to change now, right now. I need to learn to be at peace, to rejoice in the fact that God is refining me in that process, wants to refine me in my end process, if I allow him to do that. And that's a slow learning process, I honestly admit that. And it may take me until I die, until I'm ready to walk that road. Standing forth in the faith, next slide. 1 Peter 5. He calls us to humble, the need to humble ourselves before God. Verses 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And again, as I read those verses again, you just say, God, that doesn't make any sense. But God says to me and you, he says, I love you. Bottom line, I love you, you're my child. Will you choose to trust me? Will you allow me to take everything that I allow to come in your life and bring good out of it? Yes, we can make bad decisions at times and those decisions sometimes can cause harm in people's lives and we know that. But again, I believe that God can even take those situations and redeem them, restore them if we allow him to do that. The question is, am I ready to humble myself, to trust and say, God, you've got this. I'm your child, you've got this, you've got me, and I'm ready to have you work out your will in and through me. And I have to take us back to Philippians 4, right? Paul's comment to the church at Philippi, do not be anxious about anything, but pray with thanksgiving, and on and on he goes. Again, just statements that push me to say, really, in all things, do not be anxious. Final. Next slide, please. Standing firm in the faith causes us, calls us, I should say, to be looking ahead. Be aware, resist Satan. 1 Peter 5 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. We need to remember life's a spiritual battle, it's a challenge. And I know that all of us have probably walked through those times of challenge at some point. But again, I want to encourage you, we've got to think back to our beginning. The disciples were average, normal, hardworking, everyday humans who God had called and said, follow me, trust in me, walk with me, and I will make you fishers of men. He did not choose Batman or Superman or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman. He chose you and I. And sometimes I think he looks at us as supermen, as superwomen, at wonder women, saying, with my power in you, you can be all that I want you to be. Last slide. Is life fair? No. It's not fair that my young friend Saul had to come to Canada as a refugee in ESL classes up to this point even yet. He continues in ESL classes simply to learn the language. What will God have in store for him? I don't know, but I believe that God is working in him. I believe God's working through him. And as he stands, free, 
as he stands fame in his, or firm in his growing faith, I believe that God's going to do a mighty work through that man. I would love to think that in some years down the road, he will be the Saul. He will become the Paul that Saul and the apostle in the scriptures became. Is it life fair for those families in New Mexico who this week are burying their loved ones? No. But I believe that God is already bringing healing and comfort into their lives. And somehow, in some way, will redeem that situation. On the flip side, I pray that God will never call me to walk that road of the death of a child or the death of a family member in that kind of a setting. But I also believe and hopefully and trust that if that situation ever did take place in my life, in your life, that we would be able to say, God, I trust. I'm standing firm in my faith and my belief that, God, you are with me. God is present. He is with us. He loves us. We are his children. And I just want to encourage you today that no matter what you are walking through, whatever any of us, and we, none of us know what tomorrow will bring, what this next week, or this next, next month, this next year will bring. We don't know. Are we ready to say, God, I will trust in you. I will stand firm in my faith. Song leaders are going to come in a moment. We're going to sing a song called In the Quiet Curve of Evening. We sang it and heard it sung numbers of times during COVID, 587. The question, and look, as, as the songwriter writes, it's where do I experience the presence of God? Where do I see God in my life? Where do I hear him speak into my life? In the quiet curve of evening, in the trials and the issues, God is present. Song leaders, come on up and lead us. Hymn number 587. Diane will play it through once for us. Follow in your hymn book, please, so we can get the melody in our minds and the wonderful words it represents.
this time, I ask the ushers to come forward. We, uh, we have um, restarted the tradition of passing the plate in the church. Um, and it is um, with refreshing thought that we're almost back to normal after this thing that we have been through for the last three years called COVID. I'd like to <clears throat> say a prayer for our givings. God of great wonders, we join with you in the joy of the season of giving. You give us a savior who is Christ the Lord. You give us life and breath. You fill the world with beauty, our hands with bounty, our hearts with the desire to give. Accept these gifts and ourselves in service always in every, se every season, amen. echo Claire's warm welcome to Robbie this morning. It's been a rough week, and Robbie asked this morning that we continue to hold him in our thoughts and prayers. And there are many in our congregation, including family members who we know by name, that we hold in our thoughts and prayers, including our households of faith for this week, the Penner households and the Nafziger household. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Good and gracious God, teach us what it means to be strong and to stand firm in our faith. Guide us to live lives to the fullest of our capacities and gifts, all for your glory. May our words and actions be generously seasoned with grace and kindness, compassion and empathy. Nurture the good fruits of peace self-control, and joy in our lives and in your church. When life is difficult, as it can be at times, due to emotional, physical, or relational pain, whether it be stressors of family life, work, or school, 
We confess that we don't always show up our best selves. Forgive us when we harm others from our unhealed wounds. Grant us a forgiving spirit toward those who do us harm. Restore us to wholeness. Heal and transform our brokenness into wisdom, gracious living, and humility. Foster in us a forgiving and obedient spirit, ready to share the love of Jesus with all whom we share life. God of the journey, make us strong and firmly rooted as we're being transformed by your love and care for us. Let the distractions of greed, selfishness, or pride never take root in our thoughts or hearts. May we discern your voice above all other voices in our lives. Grant us courage and strength amid suffering. May we persevere and be resilient to withstand all that would lure us away from your good way. God of peace, we pray for those who are suffering due to war and violence, those who are displaced due to wildfires or floods. We pray for children who are hungry, parents unable to provide. We pray for wisdom for world leaders and lasting peace that comes from making justice. Listening God, we also bring our needs to you in prayer and the needs of our loved ones. Be with the lonely. Comfort the grieving and those who are journeying hard paths. Grant deep peace to those living with anxiety, worries, or addiction. Heal those recovering from surgery or injury. Grant patience to those receiving treatments or awaiting test results. We pray for those who are living with increased physical limitations and those who journey the shadow of death. May your comfort and presence of peace draw near. Faithful God, gather us into the warmth and security of your embrace and the stronghold of your love. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And please stand now for our sending song and remain standing for our sending blessing. I'd like you also to follow the notes in 829 if you wish to open your hymn book.
And as you and we together head into this week, prepared to stand firm in the faith, receive these words of prayer and blessing adapted from Colossians chapter 1. Let's pray. O oh God, we ask you to fill us with the knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that we may live a life, a life worthy of you, Lord, and may please you in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in spiritual wisdom and knowledge. Strengthen us with power according to your glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience Joyfully giving thanks to you, Father, as we walk this road of life. Jesus, guide our steps. Pour out your blessing on us and through us. Fill us with your love. Amen and amen. Go in God's peace.